Greetings everyone. This is HR Elevate podcast and today we have with us Ms. Mukta Arya, CHRO, Chief Resource Officer of the EPAC region at Society General based out of Hong Kong. She has over 25 years of experience. That's a quarter of a century. 25 years, that's almost as much as my whole age. You know, <laughs> when I when I went through your profile, I was like, you completed your master's in 97. That's uh-huh. the time I was born. You were born in 97. Okay, yes. <laughs> we are two I mean, different generations. Uh, yeah, and uh, you know, the aspect I looked at uh, or my focus went on is how much of knowledge and wisdom must be hidden out there in, you know, your experiences, in your learnings, in your encounters, how much Mm -hmm. wisdom you have acquired over the years, how much learning and experience you have gathered Mm -hmm. through, especially as you have worked through multiple countries, India, Singapore, Hong Kong, Mm -hmm. and at different levels. Okay. Yeah. I'd love to move forward with, you know, having a peek into your brain. I'm happy to do that. So yeah, uh, let's go for it. Great. Thank you. So let's start with, you know, the very first time you went for HR, Mm -hmm. what made you choose HR as a job vertical or as a career path? Yeah, you know, it was actually an accidental career for me. Um, I grew up in a family, you know, my father was engineer, my mother is a doctor, my sister is a doctor, so I wanted to be a doctor. So I never thought about going out of science. So I took science um, in my high school and in university. But uh, as fate had it, uh, I could not get admission into uh, medical school. I lost by few marks because at that time, you know, we could get direct admission uh, into medical college after 12th standard, you know. Uh, so mm-hmm. didn't get it. So I went into life sciences and biotech in my bachelor's. Uh, I also did one year master's. Uh, so and midway during the master's in biotechnology, um, I got a little bit bored because I thought that I prefer people around me. I like to talk to people. And the life of a scientist was something which I felt uh, will not suit me very much. So at that time, you know, it was 1995 and there was a lot of uh, talk about MBA and in Mumbai University, then I applied for it and I got into MBA. Now, when I got into MBA, the aim was that I would want to go into marketing because that's what I liked most, you know, marketing um, uh, as well as sales. So that was my aim. But there were some topics. So, you know, in the first year of MBA, you have all subjects and we had organizational psychology and I fell in love with HR then. In the second year, when we had to choose specialization, I chose HR, which at that time was called personal management and industrial relations. And um, I did my master's uh, with specialization in uh, what we call uh, PM and IR. Okay. And that's how my HR career started. I joined my first company, SR, as a management trainee in HR. And after that, for the next 25 years, I did change companies, but I remained within HR. And I still love HR very much. And that's why you see me here. Wow. This is wonderful. You know, having the zeal to make yourself better and the people around you better. That's just wonderful. So what was your first, you know, when you joined in at SR, what was the Mm -hmm. very first challenge that maybe got you excited or got you a bit, what do I say to that feeling? You know, a bit of fear, a bit of excitement, a bit of happiness and Mm -hmm. some uncertainty. Um, You know, everything, when I joined SR, it was SR Power Limited. I remember in Mumbai, our office was in Mahalakshmi. Everything excited me, you know, even punching uh, papers and making personal folders, uh, uh, looking at, I don't know, the leave records, because everything was new for me. So it was very exciting for me. 
uh, I was handling um, a few small companies that were given to me. So I was directly reporting to the heads uh, after one year of my management training. Uh, and um, uh, I think it was more, what I learned was really how to interact with people. So it was the interpersonal skills which got honed. You know, what are the kind of things that you can discuss with employees, how transparent, you know, you have to be, uh, how you can be genuine to employees while managing, uh, you know, the fine balance between being an employee champion and a management representative. And this is what was not very easy in the beginning because, Sometimes as HR, we tend to be either too employee-centric or too management-centric, you know. And, and for me, again, it's a very fine line and we need to walk that tightrope. So this is what was in the beginning was a little bit difficult because I was maybe a little bit here, sometimes a little bit there. But over the years, I think this is what you learn, you know. It comes with experience. I don't think there's any shortcut to learn that, yeah. Totally true. There's never a shortcut to learn. And also, yeah. you know, when you mentioned that you have to walk the tightrope of uh, the one side is going to management centric and the other side being too employee centric. And you yeah. just can't lose the balance. It's somehow, this is my understanding, please uh, do give yeah. me insights on it, that it's too difficult at that point to identify, you know, if this decision will be too employee centric as a result especially in mm -hmm. the first few years of your journey as an HR yeah. or at any role for that matter. Mm -hmm. Yes, it is it definitely it's true because uh, sometimes, you know, there are situations where there are no precedents. So you can't go to mm -hmm. somebody and ask them or sometimes things are too confidential. And then, you know, uh, you basically need to depend on yourself, maybe your gut feeling, you know, to take a decision. And of course, sometimes they may not be right, you know, you may make a wrong decision. But again, for me, it's all a learning process. And you learn when you make mistakes. You learn to really trust your gut, you know, when there are certain decisions to be taken. It's just, you have to be, I think what I feel is that even if the decision sometimes is wrong, if you feel that you have done it with the, with the best intentions, you know, for the employee and for the organization, and you are genuine, you know, you're authentic, then frankly, for me, that's the, then you will make a decision, even if it is wrong, you still will do something which is not going to harm somebody, you know. So for me, I think that was the learning that you really need to listen to your gut, you need to be authentic and genuine, and you need to really have the best intentions, you know, of the employee and the company. And then frankly, you will sleep well at night, you know. Because your conscience is there. And in human resources, it's not easy because you are making decisions which impact other people. So you have to be, you have to do things which will help you to sleep at night better, you know, <laughs> and not do something which will really haunt you forever in your in your life. So for me, I think this is what um, I, I did learn, but it came with uh, a lot of trials uh, and tribulations. It was not like I just did everything right, you know, from day one. Uh, I made mistakes, a uh, number of them, but I learned from it. And then you get up again and then be more, uh, uh, and then you don't do it again because the same mistake you do again, it's not a mistake, you know, then it's deliberate. True. Yeah, yeah. So what do you think is the biggest challenge faced by HRs in their first two years of journey. As you have, you know, been there, then you directly manage them as a senior HR. And now mm -hmm. as a CHRO, you must have dozens of them, if not more, under you. Yeah. So for me, I think uh, the first thing is really to, the cultural fit is very important. And, and this is something which takes time. It doesn't happen from day one. So it may take three months for some people, six months for other people, nine months for some other people. It depends on that. And for me, for HR professionals who join a new organization, it is really to understand the business, first of all, because sometimes I still find that uh, people, when they join in HR, they still do not know how we make money in the bank, you know, for example. Yeah. So I think the that's the basic thing that the whichever company you are joining, you need to understand 
what is the business model how are we making money is it profitable not profitable and only then we can understand you know how you have to do recruitment training development etc can you imagine if i don't know what a trader does and i'm designing a program for traders you know i mean or we don't know what a or what a uh, sales person in global finance does but we are recruiting them you know so i think that for me is the bedrock and and sometimes it takes time to understand if you are coming from a different industry a second as i said is culture is quite important how things work here what are the written the unwritten rules i think more the unwritten rules of getting things done you know how decisions are taken um, is it uh, is it something which is uh, uh you know uh, a collective decision or there is one person who takes a decision how are how are for example people how people treat each other you know what are the things which are acceptable in terms of your uh, etiquettes or not i think for me that is that is what is important and if the hr professionals are not able to understand that and adapt to it that's why you see sometimes you know people want to leave within 3 months 6 months is because yeah. of that misfit you know the culture misfit which is there so for me i think that's the most important thing the rest i think people can pick up because hr is a transversal kind of role you know so uh, in you may be in different industries i worked in different industries the essence is the same you know it's the managerial relationship interpersonal skills is the coaching that you do these are er cases they are all very similar but what makes a difference is really understanding the business that you have and the culture of the place which is unique for every single company which is there you know even they they may be of same like for example we are french uh, origin company but and but we cannot we are not the same as other french origin companies you know so we still have our own unique thing which we have so so that i think is very important and that's okay. the biggest challenge here uh, for the new joiners here wow that's quite interesting having the openness to learn mm-hmm. the cultural fit and knowledge of how the business functions work yes so then as you mentioned about business functions i wonder what's your approach towards aligning the business goals to employees goals or desires i mean it has to be aligned frankly because otherwise uh, you cannot you cannot do anything in hr huh? uh, we cannot work in silos so it's important that um, as hr professionals we are close to the business you know we are talking to them if possible sitting uh, in the area where the business is sitting you know so for example we have uh, hr area which is of course protected uh, but my hr business partners were different functions they spend a lot of time on the floor you know they sit there maybe okay. Uh, once twice or thri- or th- or three days uh, you know in a in a week depending of course on the needs you know uh, but they they mm-hmm. do spend a lot of time with the employees for me that is the most important part because if you are not talking to the business if i am not talking to the business i do not know or i am not participating in say our management committee meetings where we are talking about our strategy about what business what we want to do what is our goal for few few months you know down the line etc and i'm not cascading it to my team how will we know what we need to do for recruitment how do we know what we do for training how do we know what we need to do for anything else that support the business i mean we need to be very clear about our role that we are advisors to the business in managing their team and if we do not know what they want to do how are we going to actually do all the things that we are doing for me it is hand in glove it it is interlinked it cannot be in isolation you know so so for me the question doesn't even arise that things are aligned it has to be aligned otherwise we will not work you know so yeah uh, would you like to share any instance where this was a challenge aligning the business goals and the employees desires or demands i think um, you know not not all employees uh, so you, if you are a big organization every every employee is unique you know they have their own aspirations they have their own values and sometimes there are value mismatches you know where people feel that okay what the company wants to do in in as a strategy is not what i believe is right i think we should be doing in a different way now of course you know there are certain decisions which we cannot influence uh, all the time you know if it's a overarching goal which is there we can discuss with our managers and see 
how they can explain to us uh, you know of why certain things are done uh, in a different way or why not this way why not that way etc but frankly there are there are people who do not who are the goals are not aligned you know the values are not aligned and for me it has happened many times huh? and then uh, then the people do not stay because it's a clash every day you know if you feel miserable every day because you do not agree with what the company goal is then what is the option i think you have to leave you know uh, of course if there is something which we can make a change as a company or if there is something which is maybe is an improvement area then i think we listen to to the employees that's why our hr business partners are there managers are there and managers are are the proximity managers are the most important ones you know of listening to employees if something can be changed we can do it you know but frankly if it is a huge mismatch then maybe it's not the right fit you know i mean you know we don't have to be tied to something we are not trees as they say you know we can move if True. we think it is working for us if it's ma- making happy as an employee we stay in a place otherwise we move on you know it's it's that's what life is we have to find what suits us so as an employee we need to find what is suitable for us as an employer we have to find the right fit and i think you know that uh, that most of the uh, when people leave it's also because sometimes these is a value mismatch or it's like what you said the goal alignment is not there and there is no common ground you know to basically bring it together and that's when people take decisions of leaving so yes i think um, i can't take individual exp- uh, you know instances but uh, there have been quite a few uh, however what i feel is that as hr and managers if in the beginning when we are hiring people we are transparent we are genuine we are authentic and we tell the picture of the company as it is and not sugar coat you know or not give to them a rose tinted glasses i think that's when these kind of situations can go down drastically you know because people come join you with open eyes yeah and then they yeah. know what they are getting into and there is no sugar coating i think for me that is the best one because from the beginning you know whether you are aligned or not you know with the business so yeah uh, that's great that's really important having the transparency to share mm-hmm. that this is who we are this is what we are looking for exactly and yeah. this is what we are offering yeah and not over promise you know because sometimes this might happen you know that we might over promise because we want to hire that person but for me uh, i feel that it's better to be frank direct you know and just give the picture as it is because it is a big decision you know when when we when somebody joins the company it's it's a big decision so and it's a lot of cost involvement for the company and for the employee uh, in terms of time efforts as well as uh, monetary cost you know so yeah totally and uh, as uh, if we go towards its business uh, imp- implications so even time and efforts will eventually translate into money so yes. and businesses should uh, and usually do revolve around how much we are earning versus how much we are spending and optimizing the yes efforts. yeah yeah so as we go towards employees and their betterment uh, there are employee engagement activities employee development activities and yeah. i understand similarly there are leadership development activities mm-hmm. so i would like to have your take on how employee development activities for lower level employees like lower management middle management and upper management then leadership how do the engagement and development activities of these four verticals differ um okay i think maybe i would try to put it uh, that uh, development is is part of what we call engagement yeah so okay. uh, what we look at as a company is to is to make sure that employees at every level are engaged so it means that it's not only is a job that they do whether the job is meaningful or not the work environment which is good training and development which is one part of that engagement part which is there and then they are compensated well and and you know there is wellness well being and caring okay so so for me this is one part of the entire engagement piece which is there now for me 
whether an employee is a junior, mid-level, senior, etc. For me, I think there are. We need to understand what is the motivation for these people. Now, again, every employee is unique. Everybody has a different motivation model, you know, for us. So, mm -hmm. um, okay. however, of course, uh, we try to do customized thing, but it's not that easy, you know, sometimes. So, what you do is you have to see that at when you're junior in your position, then this is what you look for, which is more knowledge, you know, uh, knowledge and skills is more important, which is there. So, we focus more on that in terms of training and development. However, with today's generation, and we have four generations, as you can imagine, and fifth one is going to join pretty soon. So wow. basically, yeah, it's it's not the same huh? for even for uh, the knowledge and skill level may be very high for junior people because there are a lot of resources available, you know, outside of the company. So it's not only the company hmm. thing which is there. Then maybe they are looking for softer skills. So for me, again, what I will see is that we do have programs for junior, mid-level, senior you know, people and leadership, uh, leadership development programs. We have, uh, what we focus on is that this is led by the employee themselves. Their own training and development is in their hand. We give them a bouquet of programs, you know, which are there for data skills, for example, for presentation skills, communication, those kind of things. So we try to put them in these buckets. We do recommend that, okay, if you are at a beginner level, so we don't say junior, senior, mid-level and all. We say that at the beginner level, this may be useful for you. You know, so this is recommended. Yeah. We also have in our LMS, you know, you have AI driven kind of tools now where, for example, if you are maybe a junior analyst, but your level for presentation is already at advanced stage, then they throw up programs which are more advanced, you know, for you. So for me, again, that entire traditional model of training, which is for junior, mid, senior leadership, I think it has become a little bit topsy-turvy where we still have some structured program, but we give a bouquet of programs and the manager and the employee, they decide what is best for them, you know? So for example, for me, I can be, uh, I, I may be senior, you know, in that term, you know, but okay. I may be a beginner in data analytics, you know, <laughs> or beginner in learning Python, you know. So for me, mm -hmm. again, I cannot say that just because I'm a leader, I should be given an advanced level of data analytics training because I really don't know the basics, you know, <laughs> which are there. So for me, I can go to the basics. So that's why for me, it is more you take charge of your career, you decide what you want to do. You know, things like what you have on LinkedIn Learning, you decide your goal and then it throws up things and then you work on that. So for me, I would still keep the structure for different, uh, which is which is the guide for people, you know, and some programs which are mandatory for different levels. But the rest, the majority of them will be depending on your manager and the employee, you know, to figure out. Yeah. Okay. Hmm, quite interesting. So using AI to drive your LMS is quite an interesting aspect. And I understand that managers can suggest what each of their managees uh, should take as a course and then uh, the person can choose and go. Yeah, I can. Course. I can allocate. Yeah, I can allocate. But, you know, normally, frankly, I feel that if people do not want to learn, even if you force them, they will never learn. You just mentioned managers can suggest or allocate courses yes. to their juniors and individuals can choose their own uh, desired learning outcomes and courses accordingly. Mm -hmm. So you are yes. elaborating on that. Yeah, I was just saying that I can allocate if I feel that there is a certain program, you know, which will be beneficial. You know, I can allocate it to my uh, to my uh, reportee. However, uh, what I was trying to say is that if a person doesn't want to learn, even if you, you know, force them to learn, they will never learn, you know. So you can take the horse to the water, but you cannot make them drink. So... Oh, Apart from some mandatory training, which we really want to look at it, you know, because these are the topics which the bank requires uh, for every employee to know. We do do mandatory training because it does, of course, help. But majority of the programs are non-mandatory. That means people choose. And because training and development is expensive, we do want people to really attend those courses which are either beneficial for them, you know, for their personal development or for professional development. So for me, I would still insist that employees 
should discuss with the manager and then take charge of it themselves you know instead of we telling them what they need to do because otherwise the interest will not be there you know so for me i think it should be it should be a self initiated kind of thing and if an employee doesn't want to get developed i think frankly let's use the money on somebody else you know we have limited resources you don't have mm-hmm. unlimited resources so please use it on people who really want to learn gain from it and use it you know for the benefit of the organization and themselves i think that's what i would say yeah totally i totally agree with that how it may sound cruel or you know uh, unemotional okay that you know that person's not learning let's just switch but mm-hmm. in the end you are actually benefiting the organization and the person as well the uh, there must be an underlying reason why that person is not willing to learn maybe exactly. the person is not interested in the job or the role or the environment so yeah and again i think yeah yeah and i think what i think very strongly about is that we all work in an in in an environment where most of the organizations that we are working they are for profit organization you know so we need to also really make use of the resources that we have and again we do not have unlimited resources so really focus on people who gain from it yeah and if people are not interested then frankly it's for them they are all adults you know we are not school children in organizations and that's what i believe that as an adult you know when we can take care of our families our children we can take care of what we or we know what we want to do if we do not know what we want to do that's why we have support from the organization to help discover but if an employee is not interested in even discovering you know what they really lack or what they want to learn etc then i don't know whether we should be spending time you know on them yeah yeah i agree with that so you also mentioned uh, during employee engagement uh, excerpt that uh, you have to take care of a employee's well being uh, so it should cover the two facets physical well being and mental well being so how do you go about covering these both especially you know since past few years mental health awareness yeah. ha- mm-hmm. is on the rise So. actually we have been uh, in our bank we have been looking after well being for a very long time we had uh, a program called life at work uh, globally uh, uh, for us and even in apac we have been looking at um, physical well being uh, through activities through staff clubs um, health checkups etc for quite a long time now you know and health and wellness month we had for quite some time and mental well being as you rightly said it took uh, uh, you know it became of course the focal point uh, recently uh, so we we did of course uh, you know uh, start having a number of initiatives in this particular field because uh, frankly if mental health is not um, is not sound then you can't do anything else you know so in terms of benefits like for example uh, you know uh, uh, the cost of psychiatrist uh, which was not earlier there in our medical benefits we added that we started programs for mental uh, health uh, first aider uh, courses you know for employees and and we realized that uh, people are very interested in it because we all know somebody who maybe are going through you know some sort of uh, uh, mental mental uh, issues and we don't even sometimes come to know that they are going through it because we are not aware of it so we saw that there was a lot of uptake on that we do a monthly bounce out series you know on topics which are related to mental well being for all employees in the region but i think the most important thing on mental well being is the psychological safety which if it is not there in the organization if employees don't feel psychologically safe then all the issues come up so for us also it's a lot of uh, uh, training for employ for managers you know to make sure that they are able to provide a psychologically safe environment for the employees they able to pick up you know if there are certain issues which are there in team dynamics etc which is stressing out people how to really take care of them and i think for me that is the most important outcome that came out of the recent years you know where people went through all that and the psychological safety part became quite important and at the base of psychological safety is trust you know so again we work through of course uh, through training programs and all 
it's not easy because this is something which is also part of the personality whether people are trusting not trusting how much can you trust how much you know all those kind of things but i think we are very focused on it and we really want to make sure that we are giving our employees a safe environment an inclusive environment you know where they feel that they don't have to think of other things but they can focus on their work you know uh, in a in a very in a constructive way so uh, multiple initiatives uh, but which will basically help them to to really uh, have a sound mental health and 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 sound physical health i think that that's our aim for well being so uh, i'd like to dive a bit deeper into the mental health initiatives mm -hmm. so uh, what are the specific initiatives that gave you the best results and what initiatives do you think can be improved and the third section what initiatives do you think are needed but are not available right now i think uh, you know in asian countries so we are present in uh, 11 markets in asia and we do find that talking about mental health is still not very prevalent you know people are still not very open about it and and employees still feel that if they say that okay they have a mental health issues then maybe their progression in the company will be stunted because you know uh, the companies might think that that you know they are not fit for the job etc so i think for me one of the major challenges that that how do we really Uh, what i was talking about the safe environment uh, not only in terms of working together but also speaking up or also maybe sharing that okay i have this particular condition and there's nothing wrong about it you know it's like i have a nose which is longer compared to some other people so you know it can happen we are different people so i think that is that is the most important challenge that i feel it's there in apac is apac countries is where people still feel there's a stigma related to mental health issues you know and it's not open openly or for example people may not want to say that oh i went to a psychotherapist or i went to a psychiatrist you know because i had this particular issue even to to the managers i think sometimes employees would not open up uh, the initiatives that we looked at and that's why one of the thing was on on this mental health first aid or where uh, we train employees uh, through a certified company you know who will basically make us aware of what are the kind of situations can which can arise and employees can feel free to talk to you know the mental health first aider if if um, they have some issues and they feel like talking to somebody we also have eap you know so and there are counselors hotline not only for employees but also for uh, the families you know which is there which i think is good because people sometimes like to be anonymous they may not want to speak to an employee who is a mental health first aider because of the stigma but they may speak to the hotline you know which is anonymous you know for for the family and i think that that's uh, something which um, i think is a bedrock we we really need to do it in any organization the medical support i spoke about earlier you know the support from um, all the talks which happen because there are a number of things you know which are there which are from the uh, on various topics which we may not think about but they are very useful you know for for example sometimes you have to handle you know uh, your children uh, where they are adolescent you know so sometimes the behavior is a little bit different for example i uh, there was a broken heart syndrome talk which i didn't know about it frankly but then i read wow. about it and then uh, then i was i wanted to attend the thing i couldn't attend it but at least now i know that there is something you know which is like this and it is perfectly normal but there are some things which can which can which is happening around us but we are not aware of it so i think those those things are quite important we are also piloting uh, you know some apps which are related to uh, some uh, little bites about some uh, mental health topics which are there maybe questions that we may have you know so we can ask a coach uh, on on that so those are the things we are making available for our employees so that even if you do not have maybe an issue etc but at least you are aware of it yeah and when you see it around you in your employees in your team members etc you are able to identify that no it is it is something which needs more attention you know and how 
I as a person or an employee or a manager can really help them. So for me, these are the things that we are trying to do. It's again, it's uh, it's initial stages. We want to do more to make sure that again people feel safe. Uh, psychological safety uh, training programs that I spoke about. Um, we also want to make sure that uh, we are a diverse and inclusive environment because for me, a lot of things also come from there where sometimes people have to really curb their genuine self, you know, to fit into a thing which is not theirs, you know. So it's just like, uh, for example, I'm an Indian, but if I feel that, oh, you know, if I wear my Indian clothes and then people are going to think that, okay, I'm not very international and all those kind of things. It's going to stress me out, you know, at one point of time because it's not me, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. So for me, DEI, uh, the the policies that we have, you know, for, for example, for LGBT plus community, uh, the gender and the cultural diversity, uh, uh, the programs that we have, um, all these speak up culture where people can talk about things about discrimination or if they feel that they are not feeling safe, psychologically safe. For me, all these kind of things together will help us to create a mentally sound kind of, you know, environment for employees. So we're doing it, but I think we have a lot to do. Uh, and it's not easy. It's not easy in um, in cultures, in APAC, you know, to really make it uh, something which is people are open about. So, so for me, I think we are still at that stage where we are creating awareness and we see some things happening, but um, I think there are more, much more things to be done. And we'll continue to do it because for me, it's a consistent effort, you know, from everybody, from the top, from the managers, but also from the employees. Yeah. That's really interesting. And what about some initiatives that you would want to have for your employees? You have not found them or they do not exist as of now. Um, I don't know, because we do, we do try to look at, you know, the various offerings which are there in the, in the market. And there are a lot of startups, uh, you know, which are working on uh, mental uh, well-being uh, topics. So we are looking at it. Uh, uh, as I said, we are also piloting one of them, you know, in, in one of our country in Singapore, where we are basically uh, asking employees to take advantage, you know, of the tools and the tips that are available uh, on that. Um, I think what I would um, what I would maybe look for, and I think it's available in some of the apps, is uh, the real time kind of um, support. So if I have I'm going through something, I have an urgent question, you know, like a panic mm -hmm. button kind of thing, and then we get an answer uh, on that one from mm -hmm. us from a certified person or the person who understands, you know, the the issues. I think that could be quite useful. I know AI chatbots can do some things, but maybe to a limitation, it's not something, you know, sometimes you need something more. So maybe mm -hmm. that's something I would like to have. Uh, I will still have to discover whether it's already available in the market or not. Yeah. Wow, that's something that will really help. You cannot replace human touch with AI. There are some things that just cannot. Yeah, happen. it just cannot. Yeah, yeah. There's uh, one more question that I've been meaning to ask since mm -hmm. quite some time. What was the cultural difference throughout these three countries you have worked at? India, Singapore, Hong Kong. Okay. And were there any challenges that you experienced through this journey of multiple countries? Oh, yeah. So first I moved from Mumbai to Hong Kong and then Hong Kong to Singapore and then back. Um, the difference definitely is there because you know it's um, there are there are similarities between Indian culture and Chinese culture which I discovered over a period of time. You know the colors that are used for auspicious colors and some of the festivals. Actually, there are similarities. Um, the difference in culture was, um, uh, of course, you know in India we are. Um, uh, I was speaking quite fast, so when I came to Hong Kong, I realized that I do need to pace myself. You know. Uh, and then okay. make sure that check with people whether they understand or not. So, and you know, it's 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 very obvious because it's also the accent that we have and an accent that people have in Hong Kong and Singapore. Uh, but it's also, uh, you know, the way people live, the way people 
working style is is very different uh, and it is you will only come to know when you are in that environment you know so as a visitor i could never figure out the difference in but day to day you know you see when people even come to the desk uh, how do they clean their desk or you know go first go and get the water bottle with the with the tea uh, for me it was a little bit different uh, because uh, uh, i was not doing the same uh, you know in india uh, but again it's how you talk how you basically you know respect um, hierarchy uh, how decisions are made uh, for example uh, how for example you dress up simple things like those you know everything there is a difference okay so i will not say that it's the same because it is it is different uh, you learn you learn by uh, by immersing yourself in the culture of the place getting to know the history of the place getting to know what people like what is what is the um what are the kind of food people like you know uh, i think food really makes you understand a lot more about people you know and then going out with the people uh, really spending i don't know hiking or 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 a lunch uh, is is really useful to understand it is different it is not the same uh however what remains the same is we are all human beings you know so the feelings that you have uh, you know of joy of sadness etc they are very similar you yeah? know so um uh, for me when i went to these places really getting to know the culture of the place uh, visiting their local places the temples uh, eating the local food was what really made me understand what the culture is all about and it really helped me when i was doing my job because when i'm talking to employees in a particular location i could understand where they are coming from you know so for example in singapore i did learn a little bit of singlish you know which is uh, mm-hmm. in hong kong cantonese was a bit difficult because it's uh, it's not that easy you know uh, but again you know understanding the kind of food people eat how people walk on the street so and on the escalator you stand on the right hand side versus left hand side and you know those kind of things it really it really helps you to immerse in the culture of that place yeah so uh like singapore english is like marathi wali hindi something when they use a few words of marathi and yes, parts yeah. of it yeah oh that would be quite interesting yeah so was there any experience of totally opposite cultural experience for example you as you have stayed in india for the you know grooming years of your life mm-hmm. uh, in mumbai and then you went to a different country and there on you experience a cultural phenomena that in the first experience first encounter totally subverted your understanding of how people were yeah i think uh, i think i did it was mostly during uh, for example in decision making you know how do you make decisions so uh, sometimes you know you want to take decisions which is on your own or there are few people who will agree but for example i work in a french organization where we also look at consensus you know which is there there are similarities in asian cultures frankly so i will not say drastically different relationship orientedness is is everywhere you know so how you build relationship with people frankly it's similar you know it's not different at all i think is those little little things of the work culture where uh you know how, the way you work in office uh, in in meetings you know how do you how do you conduct the meetings etc those those are a little bit different but it's not drastically different frankly i must say that it's not drastically different but cultural element i told you that one is a bit different so you learn you know you learn how to how to uh, like in japan for example you know i didn't know that um, you you sleep on tatami mats but then you know in india also sometimes we sleep on the floor so on on the mats so i think that's why i'm saying there are similarities which i could only see when i went into those cultures and really immersed myself into it and i could see that even though it seems very different in certain ways but there are also a lot of similarities which are there so you just learn you know and i think um, for me uh, i don't know because it's it's now 13 years away from india i think i must have had culture shock but now it it seems like it's a global village you know everywhere it's 
it seems to be okay i, I i'm not shocked very easily nowadays you know so yeah yeah wow you have uh, developed as they say hard skin in this aspect through your experiences yeah <laughs> that's great okay uh, one last question mm mm-hmm. what are your plans for world mental health day that's on october 10 so we we actually already have uh, health and wellness month going on in apac you know where we are doing a number of initiatives which are there uh, so uh, we have some talks which are there uh, lined up for that uh, for the employees uh, which is there and then um, i think we will yeah we will go through that but for me it's not just one day it is a continuous initiatives throughout the year you know for employees and and when they need it so uh but yeah it's it has a special place for for all of us because i think as a bank we do we do realize the importance of uh, mental health and uh, and actually are quite committed to make sure that employees are uh, mentally uh, you know taken care of the well-being is taken care of actually not only mentally but as well as physically you know yeah thanks a lot ms mukta for sharing your knowledge and wisdom and thanks a lot for your time Thank you. It was a pleasure.